let's compare the two leading cars this year. Very, very different concepts completely. Um, and if we could just sort of step through, do you want to just talk us through some of these sort of key differences between these two cars? We kind of just sort of stop there and just have a look at the overall concept to keep so off with. So the Mercedes is a really long car. They're actually both really long cars mm. compre compared to previous years. They're, they're cars largely for aerodynamic reasons, but also for reasons of the powertrain. Mm -hmm. The cars are extremely long anyway, but the Mercedes is, uh, has taken that to a new limit. Yes. And I'd say the Ferrari guys, aerodynamically speaking, might be quite interested in doing that, but you've got to find that overall balance between mm -hmm. the aerodynamic, you've got to get the overall track performance. And there, that is really nice to see that there are different solutions that have been mm -hmm. found and they will have strengths in different types of situations, different, the tightest corners, it's quite likely that mechanically mm -hmm. speaking, the Ferrari will have an edge. Okay. In the really high speed corners, it's quite likely that the Mercedes will have an edge. Again, sort of very different concepts here. Ferrari got a different nose, quite a different uh, concept on the wing, maybe not as extreme as, as Mercedes have gone. What, you know, what do you see that the teams are trying to do here? Well, the Mercedes that's racing today has a, a lot of tiny vortex generators, a lot mm -hmm. of uh, devices turning the air quite uh, abruptly, creating little vortices that then merge into bigger vortices all to do a job of work. The Ferrari follow, if you like, uh, from an aerodynamics perspective, a relatively similar philosophy that mm -hmm. you, you are, but by starting at a different starting point, you do end up also mm. evolving. So for example, if you were to take the Mercedes front wing and pop it on the Ferrari and vice versa, both cars would perform worse mm -hmm. than their normal, having their normal packages on. Yeah. Uh, I actually tried it once in my career. It was a silly thing <laughs> really? to do. <laughs> take, you never plan to race with it, but take a wing that you've designed and you know really well, a front wing that you think this is a really good front wing, put it onto an alternative vehicle where you join a team and just see what it does. And it's always a disaster. It's not a good idea. You need to follow the whole thing through, the whole car. Yes. You couldn't swap, but so sometimes the shape that you end up with is determined in part by your starting point, mm -hmm. so depending upon how, how, how you move your way around the car. And if you were, for example, if you decided, actually, I like the Red Bull concept, mm -hmm. you'd have to start from the beginning and, and, right. and work all your way through the car. And th going through these iterations does take quite a bit of time. And you're better, actually, to just continue to optimise around your own concept. Unless you see an airflow concept, for example, the first time in the distant past we, where we saw people with a curl around the, the front wheel mm -hmm. back in the 90s, yep. it was actually Minardi who were the first team to do it. That is not a concept I've investigated. I can see what they're trying to do. They're trying to take a part of the front tyre wake mm -hmm. and control it. What would we do to try and achieve the same thing and how much difference would it make? So you can snap some ideas about you can. people's things. If we just now move the cars around, I think, as you say, that the, the fronts uh, do contrast quite a lot, but probably not more so than when we start to look at the uh, turning vanes and the side pods, if we can kind of just stop there. Yep. Uh, explain to us a bit more about this sort of Ferrari inlet, which is unique to the Ferrari and something I've not really seen on a, a Formula One car ever before. Well, the, the actual intake for the cooling is a lot narrower than the apparent intake, which is huge. Mm. And so the, the outboard part of the intake will be getting quite a lot of dirty air from, from the front tyre, the front mm -hmm. part of the front tyre wake, and they are managing it and, con and then pushing it to a part of the rear of the car that, mm -hmm. they, that they want. Where, where, uh, and the actual air entry will be taking higher energy mm -hmm. air. So it looks quite different, but aerodynamically speaking, it's not so dramatically different. No, it's less aerodynamically dramatic than it is visually. When we then look at the Mercedes in contrast, the side pod itself is relatively conventional, but you have this massive amount of complexity in the barge boards and the turning vanes. Isn't it delightful? So they were the first team to start doing these, rolling up multiple small vortices that would then roll together and merge into bigger vortices to do mm -hmm. a, a big job. So you get a short-term benefit from the, from the vortex itself, and then you maintain the long-term, or if you like, further back benefit of having a, a big vortex rolling up and moving airflow to where you want it to go. So one of the things that's maybe not obvious if you're looking at the cars is the air that's going to end up 
that if the car were had no aerodynamic devices would end up going, let's say, beside the driver's ears. Mm -hmm. One of the things all these multiple vortex generators do is to roll that air up. So if it's going to come towards me, if I'm, mm -hmm. the, if I'm the driver, it rolls that air up and down towards the side pods and then part of the high energy will end up underneath mm -hmm. the car. Whereas if you just had a more conventional front wing, you'd create a, a wake mm -hmm. that rolls the air up and then would take energy out of the flow that would end up mm -hmm. going under the floor. So it's a, it's a bit of aerodynamic trickery to yeah. be able to generate a front wing with lots of power and still have clean air going up underneath the car. Because this year it's the diffuser that's been made so much larger at the back yeah. of the car and that's the thing that's really driving the, the, the downforce and the aerodynamic performance of the cars. So what you're saying is that all of the work at the front is actually being almost um, compromised really... to get this diffuser at the back of the car. Absolutely. The most efficient aerodynamic device on the vehicle so is the stop. diffuser. The mm -hmm. When you combine it with the floor, you don't take just the diffuser yeah. because the, the diffuser makes the floor, uh, the, the diffuser sucks on the floor. Mm -hmm. And that combination, the underside combination, will generate more than 60% of the total downforce, but generate, relatively speaking, a tiny proportion of the drag of the car. Mm. The rear wing is probably your least effective aerodynamic device and say for example all those vortex generators m many of them generate no downforce whatsoever they mm -hmm. generate a drag force because there's uh, especially something that is vertical yeah, there's 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 no downforce being direct being generated directly mm -hmm. and there's drag being generated because you're, you're moving the air around so the air's pushing on one surface sucking on another but they manage the airflow to the floor and mm -hmm. help you make the floor work better how much you know, sort of more efficient are these cars, do you think, uh, in 2017 in terms of downforce okay. and the drag they're creating? I work for not the highest performing team, <laughs> so I don't have actual data, but by looking at lap time simulation, looking at lap time gains, I'd say the teams have probably made a 20% improvement in aerodynamic efficiency, wow. something like that. It's huge.